about uh, Patrick. Uh, you have a history of doing so many documentaries. Thank you. I'm no surprised for bringing us another one that's pretty frightening how to know that someone's life can change within minutes all because of a car. Yeah, I mean, it's sort of, I mean, that's so, it was very funny. I hadn't thought about that aspect until very recently. And then Doug Lyman, who directed the Bourne, the first Bourne film and is now my exec said to me, look, the thing that really strikes me in this movie is everything turned on about 10 seconds. And if that guy hadn't, the innocent man hadn't been under a truck at the time that the cops were going past, he could have lived basically. And I said, yeah, absolutely. And that is, and he said, you know, it's, that's what's interesting as a human being about it. Yeah, so it was interesting watching the documentary, the first part, it's kind of like, wait, he's, he's innocent, but why does he sound like he's guilty right now? <laughs> What was your intention? What was your reasoning for that? Well, my intention was that I think in life, I, mean, I don't know about you, unless your life has been perfect. Has your life been perfect all the way no through? Such thing. <laughs> well, uh, you know, join the club. Uh, you know, I think perception is, is always something that changes. You know, you don't quite know what the truth of a situation is. And it wasn't like that, you know, everybody in Corpus Christi was, you know, a violent Hispanic hating person. And this is why this terrible thing happened. That is absolutely not what happened on that night on that murder. It was because there'd been a murder. It was horrible. Lots of police wanted immediately to find uh, the person who'd done it and there was a guy hiding under a truck half an hour after this murder who they knew had a record. And so it was like obvious to a certain extent that he could be the guy. And then from that point on, not, he didn't exactly furnish the best defense. He said, oh, if somebody else did it and he's got the same name as me, Carlos. And then he comes up at trial and for a variety of reasons, the Texas legal system was under pressure. So his attorney only had 10 days to prepare and 160 bucks to do some research. So he wasn't in the best place. And he, they were up against an absolutely brilliant prosecuting attorney who ripped him to shreds in the witness box. So his conviction was completely unsurprising. You know, it wasn't, as I said, it's not like, everybody set out to do a terrible thing. Terrible things happen almost by mistake. And that's what I wanted to show. I didn't want to, you know, I think I'm throughout my life and my career, throughout all those documentaries you've been talking about, I'm always fascinated by the truth because the truth is, you know, the truth may be out there, but it's quite tricky to find. And when you do find it, it's often exactly what you don't expect. And I think that's what, that's why I've done the movie as I did, you know, hey, he goes down at the end of the trial and you think, they've got the right guy and then he keeps up one journalist keeps in touch with them and she begins to and she just wants the interview in which he confesses his guilt and but as she talks to him she begins to think hang on this guy is still maintaining his innocent when it would make much more sense for him to say you know what i'm guilty i'll take a lesser a lesser sentence and simultaneously out of nowhere another lawyer, almost unconnected to the original case, discovers a whole set of scene photographs which show that it was bathed in the blood of the victim and the guy who'd been arrested and who was on death row and, and convicted had not a speck of blood on him. And then, so he hands them to the original trial lawyers who sort of go, well, it's all finished, it's all done. And it's only when 14 years after the crime, a New York professor, one afternoon in a dusty classroom, says, hey guys, why don't we just look at this case? That almost by complete accident, some of the truth starts to come out. And that's actually, I think, how life happens so often. It's, you know, accident followed by accident followed by accident. I was in disbelief how there was no remorse when it was brought up. Like, look at the pictures. It looks like it's contaminated evidence. You know, these pictures that, you know, the guy didn't have, you know, blood. Uh, it just doesn't make sense. Yeah, well, I think you got, it's, 
it's a funny place, corporate. So I think I want to say that it's quite. Uh, um, in those times, it was pretty tough. And so I think without descending into cliche, you know, again, back to why things happen, it was almost like, hey, look, this guy may or may not have been the right guy, though the prosecution still maintains he was. Let's be clear about that. I know even however unlikely that is, but hey, he wasn't a great person. So are we going to kill ourselves over this to get it um, injustice? No. And it's only as time has gone by and more and more evidence has come out. And the fact that the central plank of his defense was that there was some other guy called Carlos. And guess what? He, at the trial, he was described as a phantom, which is why I call my movie The Phantom. And it's only subsequently that it's a marriage that sure there was a Carlos Hernandez and he was an absolutely awful person. And I think it's only when you begin to appreciate the horror of who the other guy, the guy who actually did it was that you can read that anger start has started to come to the fore. And now people are angry, absolutely, as you say, because one of the worst things I think I've ever done as a filmmaker was interview Carlos Hernandez's victims. I mean, there was a moment I was talking to this woman in her fifth, really dignified woman in her fifties down in Mexico. And she said, she was telling me through what happened the night that she was attacked. And suddenly without any warning, she just pulled up her shirt and showed me this enormous scar running all the way down her stomach. And you just think, and she started to cry and the crew were just like, and you just thought, this is horrendous. And it's that sort of thing that brings home the horror of what went on. And for a while, society wasn't that interested in hearing it. That is really sad. That is really sad. I mean, and then the documentary also, you've mentioned that Carlos Hernandez, the real killer, um, mm. he kind of was kind of like was good at knowing information about people in a way to protect himself, including law enforcement. Yes, I think well, what, as far as we can piece it together, because you'll be amazed to hear that 40 year old records in, in a small city in Texas aren't everything they should be. Um, as far as we can piece together, what would happen would be that he would come up for, he'd be charged or you know, be arrested and then charged over something. And then at the moment that he's about to be sent to trial or something like that, he'd say, uh, hang on, I know this or that. I think it was, insofar as I can work out, it was an ad hoc system of reform. He wasn't like the regular guy on the inside of some major drugs cartel or something like that, because he was a drunk and a psychopath. And to add to his other wonderful characteristics, he was also um, incredibly violent and a pedophile. So he was um, not, as it were, he was so chaotic that there was no way he was going to be a regular police informant. He was just existing in a rough world where he would trade to get himself out of trouble, I think. But almost more important was the rough world. It, and at that time, Hispanics in Corpus, Hispanic people in Corpus Christi were getting a really rough deal. I mean, a really, really rough deal. They weren't getting any jobs. The police were continually picking on them. They were getting terrible sentences. They weren't getting decent lawyers. And that I think is almost more important than as an explanation of what really went on. Everybody was viewed to a greater or lesser extent as disposable, however much people would like to pretend the opposite. Yeah, you do give us a little history of what was actually going on out there. Um, a lot of injustice when it comes to Absolutely. anyone that was of color, but in this case, mainly Hispanics being Corpus Christi, you know, Texas. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, it's, exactly. It's, you know, territory that's been fought over, uh, was fought over for a very, very long time. And ironically, the prosecuting attorney is himself a local historian, and he it was who drew my attention to this fact and said, look, you want to understand why it's this violent in this town. Go look at the history. This place has been fought over for hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. And it's only re uh, there's a phrase in the movie he uses, he just says, it's only recently that law and order has come in. Mm -hmm. That's really sad. Yeah, you do give give good images, by the way, of history.
No, um, right. Thank you. One of the, there were three things that I found super like sad and kind of emotional. Um, the fact that you had the brother of Carlos uh, yeah. de Luna, and that was one. And then another one where you have the chaplain talking about, you know, talking to Carlos till the day, the end, and how he describes, you know, the whole procedure and the three injections, oh. like, the first one, he was supposed to fall asleep and didn't, and yet lifts his head. I mean, what must have he must have been feeling in those moments in his brain? The second shot, you mentioned that um, he was supposed to paralyze his lungs. Yes, it's all. I mean, it's awful. I couldn't. To a certain extent, I sort of couldn't believe it because whatever your views on the death penalty what it's not supposed to be amount to is somebody riding in agony for up to a minute as poison sort of rack your body and then and only then because as you said all the poisons were applied in the wrong order so the poor guy gets the one that sends him into agony and then is only put to sleep effectively afterwards not the other way around. and you just think that is completely barbaric and and the man who's telling it, the chaplain, is so dignified. And he, to this day, is scarred by it. He said, it's the, it's the worst thing that I've ever witnessed in all the time that I was the death house chaplain. I just couldn't believe it. And, and also, yeah, as you said, uh, Manuel de Luna, who uh, is Carlos's brother. And what I hope I, back to my obsession with truth, one of the things I wanted to say was, look, Carlos was no angel. His brother was really angry with him because just before his arrest, Carlos had run off with Manuel's truck and, you know, and crashed it and cost him thousands that he could not afford. So he was really mad at him. And it's only, and he, he but Manuel stayed away from Carlos's trial because he just didn't want anything to do with it. And again, not unlike the reporter, it's only as his brother is at the point of death that he realizes he's innocent and that a terrible thing has gone wrong. And he, if it was moving seeing this poor woman describing Carlos Hernandez attacking her, it was almost doubly so seeing his brother, seeing Manuel de Luna go to Carlos's grave and explain the guilt that he still felt because he had not believed him. It was anyway. Yeah. Documentary is great. You know, it's a privilege to make them sometimes, but it's also sometimes incredibly painful. To see other people's pain, yes. Oh, yeah. Who I was curious about was Wanda Lopez. Um, she she had a daughter. Yes. Jenning. Um, was she reached out? Oh yeah, no, we tried to, desperately to find her. Um, because uh, because without sounding too pompous as a documentary maker, you've got a you, you know you've got a duty to tell people you're doing this stuff and we try to reach her your country is very different to mine it's actually a lot easier to find people in in your country whereas in mine we british we're secretive so we tend not we tend to be tricky to find but actually we couldn't find her and if she is listening or watching i send respect and admiration because so many people have said that she or the scar of what her mother had gone through and this also the unresolved nature of this crime which is terrible to have to deal with because you want some form of closure after something like this and anyway cut long story we tried via uh, her attorney Brandy Rodriguez who's in the film to find her we found nothing but um, as I said if she's hearing I send respect to her mm -hmm. well um well you know what sometimes we need an eye opener about you know uh the justice sometimes they they don't get it right and it's so sad that they pretty much just went based on verbal statements sure yeah the forensics yeah i couldn't believe that they that the forensics were so shoddy and on the night the guy doing the forensics made a complete mess of them he obscured fingerprints and ignored the blood terrible and attached to this movie is a petition that has been launched by uh, a lot of major civil rights groups, a witness to innocence, ACLU, saying, look, could we commute the sentence of everybody who's on federal death row? And that 
it sounds like here's another, you know, no, the death penalty is bad. But the point about it is exactly that. The thing about the death penalty is it's irreversible. And if somebody makes a mistake, if, I don't know, you know, somebody doesn't do their job right on the night of a murder, then you would think that, oh, hang on, it, it will be spotted. But if it isn't spotted, then an innocent man or woman gets executed. And that's what happened this time. Indeed. And my third thing that I found the saddest was the fact that there was never no formal pardon till today uh -huh. from what I read on your documentary. That's yeah. really crazy. Because if anybody, it's their name that means a lot. Everything else can come and go. <laughs> that's so true. That's absolutely true. It is. And it and it's one of the other that's so true because one of the other people involved in the documentary went. I just don't want my name associated with this anymore. And so every time you Google Carlos de Luna, you get initially that he was a murderer. And then only then do you get the doubts over the case. So you're absolutely right. I, I really hope that Texas issues a formal pardon. The family have tried via a number of routes and got nowhere so, uh, several times. So if there is a movement to do it, I would back it wholeheartedly. And I think you're completely right. Yeah, at the end of the day, that's all we have. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Well, that's all we will be remembered by anyway. <laughs> yes, exactly. Well, thank you so much, Patrick, for this documentary. It was very informative. And gosh, we really got to think quick when we're in a tough situation and try to do the right thing and not get stuck in a bad place. Yeah, well, try to do the right thing or at least give yourself time to think about what you've just seen and then think, was it the right thing? Or should I change it? Right. Well, thank you so much, Patrick, for your time and discussing this documentary, The Phantom. Hey, thank you. It's been my pleasure. Likewise, thank you.